Hello everybody and welcome to another Future of the Fortress. This is the community Q&A that Toady1 does on the Bay 12 forums covering all things Dwarf Fortress, old and new. This is kind of a mix between like open qu questions and answers of the current things being worked on as well as a community brainstorming session where they talk about things to come in the future. If you'd like to take part in these discussions, there's a link to the forum thread down in the description of this video where you can go make an account and then take part in the conversation yourself. Of course, you may also leave any thoughts on things discussed here in the comments section of this video. So without further messing around, let's dive in to mission status with Threeto. The adventure continues as we thought. The first phase is progressing well. This means that the interface moving from classic to premium one per one is going well, but it's not all we have to do. We want to improve on the original. Not everyone is like you, the hardcore. We don't get good reviews from them, the confused. That's where we came up with the idea to ask for divine intervention. We want this to be a great launch, so be patient. Be little demigods and let your papa work. We promise it will be worth it. Congratulations to the generous Threeto. An interesting direction to go with that, Zach. And Tarn responds with his fun with numbers, and he says, Some tangible steps towards myth and magic are on their way, and uh, that's the post from the other week, of course. This should be fun. We also have a 50.12 patch nearly ready to go. It's been nice to have some patches while the adventure mode stuff is also underway. We'll have to see what the release situation looks like after April, once work is finally normal again, with the two modes out. We're going to try our best to continue with more regular patches, rather than long disappearances, working in new features as we go. In January, there were about 13.5 thousand copies sold. Everything is still running along smoothly. And let's dive into the general Q&A. And we start off with a curious cat, and they say, Does this mean that the portraits shown will change variations every time they're displayed, at least until they're linked to a fashion item? And Tarn quotes... Talgan, so I will read their response first, and they say, I'm going to guess it uses a random part sprite system used to randomize unit faces already. I'm pretty sure random part sticks even between game sessions, and probably using a simple RNG based on the unit ID or something. And Tarn's response is, yeah, Talgan's got this one. It's possible to randomize in a consistent way on a per item basis. This one's slightly complicated since the item can theoretically float between different creature types. If it isn't stopped by size from a human to a 70,000 size experiment, for example, so it has to be able to survive that. But that's just a matter of making the text consistent in the different raw layer entries and having any necessary art available. Whether size 70,000 experiments will have portraits with full clothing variations by the first release is a different question. The art can really go on forever in a good way, like the rest of the game. Next up is a question from Immortal D, and they say, why is the number of custom labor groups limited and with numbers instead of icons? Are there any plans to allow editing of the default labor groups? And have you ever considered adding a world painter for precision embarks? Trying to embark in good and evil tiles adjacent is incredibly difficult. Although I will add that if you were to do that right now, I don't think you'd get most of the the fancy plants spawning due to the way the current world seems to generate. That's just me adding on to that question. And then, do you know if adventure mode will be backwards compatible with existing worlds? And then they quote Tarn, where Tarn says, the adventure mode is stuff isn't directly re related, despite me working to have keyboard enabled there, but Putnam's already got some keyboard stuff working in fort mode on some additional menus, and it's already in progress. And they say, does this mean we can fully remap the submenus, like now adding a hotkey for building a door requires a custom graphic and corresponding to said keys? And I just have to state out loud bluntly, Mortal D, you should really try the uh, experimental branch, although this question was probably written before that was out. But you should really go try the experimental branch, and um, it answers most of your questions. But Tarn's response is, in regards to the custom labor groups, Tarn's first response is, we just didn't have time to do the art before de the December 2022 release, with the rest that was going on. And I didn't use custom icons that we had at the time, since... 
since there was only a few the last time I worked on it. The player custom icons between burrows squ and squads and work details, etc. could be uni more unified and useful, and I'm not sure when we'll get to it, but it certainly could use improvement. Then he asks about default labor groups, and Tarn says that is in the beta branch, al although normal restrictions on held object labors up still apply, meaning mining, hunting, and of course, woodcutting. Then in regards to World Painter, if we get back into map painting in vanilla, it'll be part of the myth and magic editors, where we want to also include things like site maps. It's an open-ended topic like most of the rest of the development, and you could spend all of the rest of dev time on map editors, and we'll likely do some stuff that goes beyond the current arena and map field files. Then in regards to adventure mode and compatibility, Tarn says, Adventure mode is compatible with existing worlds, and I think certain things like portraits and for necromancer experiments, if we get to those at all for the initial release, will be too time-consuming to get in old saves. And some of the myth and magic stuff will probably require new generated objects, which would need a new world as well. And we haven't touched the building menu yet, so as... I remember, we're just adding stuff that people want, pretty much, with an eye on getting a full keyboard enable experience back, and it's not going to happen quickly. The next question is from Zisudra, and they say, is saving in adventurer mode going to gain the same options as in fort mode, such as save and continue or save to enter new timeline? And do you think that any current features that might not make the initial adventure mode release, like camp building mentioned on blind stream. Are the controls going to be designed around W, A, S, and D? And Tarn's response is, I'm using the same save options. Yeah, and I mentioned the camp building a long while ago, and also in the latest adventure mode update post, which probably was after your, your question was asked. Since uh, it is the largest interface that isn't as core as stuff like inventory, it'll be in the second feature, i.e. not fix or tweak update if, at, if it's not in the first. And in regards to WASD movement, there's diagonal movement, so I'm not attempting WASD alone. I'm not sure what the keyboard option is for most people without number pads. Eating up the Q E W E A S D Z C X cluster or equivalent. Uh, it is really expensive in terms of lost keys that we want for non-movement options. People can rebind, of course, but it's I'd like a decent default option, and I'm open to suggestions. I'm currently just using number pad and or mouse. The next question comes in from Eurist McTinkerer, and they say, Any chance we will have key shortcuts, such as Q, plus, and minus back, in Fortress mode in the premium version? And Tarn's response is, We're slowly getting stuff back. 50.12 up on Beta Branch now has new keyboard controls for the unit lists. The next question comes in from The Beardy Man, and they say, Before the premium version, we could change the font to use for the ASCII graphics by changing the font name in the font tag in the init.txt, in addition to changing the images used for the ASCII graphics. This would also cause the map cells to be rendered with the aspect ratio of the font. In the premium version, changing the font in the font tag still changes the images used in the ASCII graphics, but the aspect ratio for the map cells remains the same as that of the default font. Will this feature, the font aspect ratio driving the display aspect ratio, be making a comeback? And Tarn quotes a few responses, but mostly Putnam's response. I'm going to read her response first, and then I will read Tarn's response, and she says... The main problems are actually related to how I did stuff in the SDL2 update. The way SDL2 does things, you have to give an explicit height and width to every texture you blit to the screen. So for the sake of expediency, making sure the game's, you know, playable on large resolutions, 
I just sort of made the decision that ASCII is going to scale assuming to the original textures are 8 by 12, and graphics scale assuming to the originals are 30 by 32 by 32. This shouldn't be terribly difficult to fix. And Tarn's addition to this question is, don't have anything to add except on top of the fix Putnam mentioned, there's a lot of marked spots in the code where, th are, where there are assumptions about 8x12 and 32x32 playing together, like unit textures in unit lists. And that would also need to be addressed specifically, and non-ugly solutions for some combinations that are not obvious. But it would be nice. Another question from a curious cat, and they say, regarding the recent Steam announcement, will demigod players be able to select which deity is their divine parent during character creation? Also, assuming that demigod here is used to refer to the child of a deity and a non-deity, will they also be assigned to a non-deity parent? Also, what about elves? Will they no longer be able to be demigods, or will it be possible for a force to be a demigod parent? And Tarn's response is, deity selection. Yeah, that's the plan. And I'm not concerned about the non-deity parents currently. Regular adventurers don't get those either, and deity selection could depend on which options are most viable for an effective tutorial. If you are going for the tutorial aspect of it. If it ends up being tight, the tutorial side of it might force a selection, but that's not the general idea. I think whether myth creation ends up being here or later uh, will have a lot to say about elven demigods. In the most straightforward, fastest implementation, you'd always be a human or a dwarf. But that situation is slowly going to get stranger and stranger. We'll also have to tutorialize completely non-magical worlds as well, eventually, or warn the player that full tutorials aren't available on these settings. Next is a little bit of a longer multi-parter, so I've split it up, and it's from Volilol, and they say, Getting a chunk of myth stuff is super exciting. However finalized it turns out. It really is a sign we're entering a new era of feature development beyond the different kind of goodiness that graphics and reworked UI has, and will continue to be. Tutorialization through deities sounds really fun, though I wonder, in worlds without deities or civilizations without, how will demigod tutorials work? Will some other being take that Tudor position, or will it be impossible to play as an atheist demigod? And Tarn's response is, I mean, if there are no gods, there are no demigods in a technical sense, and yeah, we'll have to deal with it. But default worlds will have them, so it won't be a problem, unless the player opts for it, at which point not having a full tutorial is not so bad. But yeah, ultimately if we have to go with a standard abstract tutorial that plays the same role, that's fine. It just won't be as neat and we'll be missing some cool integration with other features or be implemented in a flatter way. We'll see how this feels when I'm further along this track. Elves in forests being strictly left out of the tutorial zone is slightly weird and the force could work though the whole point of forces was not to give them personal identities at all. And even an abstract, you feel this, you feel that, still does that to some extent. And part two of the question is, will demigods from goblins, dark fortresses, get guidance from the deified Civ leader? And will mega beast followers get it from their patron rock or dragon? What if this physical deity dies? And Tarn's response is, the rocks and dragons don't become deities in vanilla. They are just worshiped by frightened and odd people. But of course, the official integration of myth and magic changes the possibilities up. Gonna have to make decisions as I go. I wouldn't expect anything here until I get the basics up. The next question comes in from Digga Knob, and they say, Will the graphics layering system be expanded or made more powerful? For instance, will more conditions for quality it like in portraits, or will conditions for other layers existing not exist and not existing be added to the regular small-scale sprites. And Tarn's response is, it's like anything else now. 
slowly expanding the conditions we've added for portraits, for instance, to work on all other layer types, like the small full body ones. A portrait is just a type of layered image. And part two of their question is, will a rework of the combat system, or at least the information displayed be done at any point soon? A lot of things are somewhat confusing, like how squareness affects armor penetration and damage, what the chances of penetration and dismemberment are to begin with, and how much skill affects things like dodging and parrying and chance to hit, etc. I think that clarity is more important than actual changes, especially considering new the newer players. And Tarn's response is, it was always lurking behind the Siege and Army update to some extent, and the return of Adventure Mode brings it back. I'm not sure what we'll have time to do for the initial release, though. There are a ton of high-priority items for new players. The mode is rough. And another question from Plump Helmet Man, and they say, if a very basic and incomplete framework of the myth and magic system is coming with the adventure mode update, does this mean the big weight might not be so big after all? At least, not counting the big weight we've already had waiting for the big weight. And Tarn's response is, we're trying to kill the big weight dead at this point. Or, yeah, as you say, the pre-graphics weight was the actual big weight. And we've already done it. It's a nice surprise, if true. The next question comes from Rum Rusher, and they say, So, with the demigod being converted into tutorial mode, is there, like, an option to have the old demigod settings? So that future runs aren't stuck to the two lesser point pool options or risk dealing with the tutorial again? The forced tutorialization of stuff kind of threw a monkey wrench into my common demigod adventure mode runs a bit. That said, I wonder what this means for multiple adventure party members uh, if one of them is a demigod. Does this lead to Tori, the goddess of Tudor, popping up to explain a feature if a player tabs over to the demigod? <laughs> And Tarn's response is, character creation is one of the big menus and screens I have left to do, and this has been on my mind a bit, yeah. Up until now, the point pools enforced some sort of difficulty, but don't have any meaning in the world. There are different interpretations for how point pools could work for different modes in the new peasant, hero, and demigod setup, with added layers of basic difficulty and roleplay. You should be able to play some kind of skilled warrior without having a divine parent, or heroic destiny for sure, with a variety of backgrounds, in a way that makes sense. The good versions of this are out of scope with the initial release. Proper background generation and selection and playing hi historical figures, etc, etc. And we'll likely just expand that concept and name away from peasant and support a varied point pool difficulty options at first. I think the tutorial aspect of guidance will be tied to the party, most likely for the simplicity. But yeah, it's surely going to get weird as deity relationships build up in the party. I suppose this has always been true, even with regular relationships, since the NPCs could hate different party members, etc. And that probably led to intra-party stuff that simmered and broke in various ways. I'm happy for it to get totally messed up as long as the tutorial aspects remain intact. Next is a multi-parter I'm just leaving in one from Beeg, and they say, Will peasant characters be able to join temple organizations to get bonuses when interacting with related deities? If so, what would the temple faction expect from the peasant character in return? Two. Will the spheres of a demigod character's divine parent matter in determining their special powers? 3. Since property rights are being overhauled, does this mean that we can no longer walk into a random warehouse and start stealing goods with no consequences? 4. Will hamlets get a new provider for food for adventurers since they don't have markets or inns? I assumed the property rights update will stop us from stealing food from random people's houses with no consequences. 5. Previously, characters could talk to their deity and get no response. With the myth and magic stuff coming, will there now actually be some form of response to talking to a character's deity? 
And Tarn's responses are, I expect it'll be the same as whatever we get to for everybody else. You'll just have to be proactive about retrieving relics or whatever we end up making easier for demigods because the deity can sort short circuit the being lost and confused part of it all. One of the reasons we're going with demigod tutorials to start is that we can quickly fix the issues in the base game with quests and flows and such. It's a larger multi-step project along the lines of adventure mode villain stuff, which included better investigation, so I'd expect stuff here, but it might be hard to accomplish. Two, it depends on how much diversity we have. We have quite a bit of available already, so it seems very possible. And then three, in regard to property rights, this is the goal. But there is a lot to police, and we're going to take some steps. Four, in, in regards to food in Hamlets, Tarn says, probably not at first, but there's a lot to do. And Tarn's final response in regards to deities and characters talking to them, that's the basic idea. We thought it would be funny if the option actually worked. The next question is from Doran the First, and they say, Hello, Toady, and thanks for this wonderful game. I have been wondering if there is any word on the Mac release for the Steam version. And Tarn's response is, no additional word. I'm stuck in Adventureland with a deadline and still need a few computers. Linux being done theoretically means the hardest part is over, hopefully. And now a double quoted question uh, from Rhino and Volleylol, and they both ask, I have a question about the giant creatures in Dwarf Fortress. Is it the case that they are very straightforwardly giant versions of the real ones, or is there more like they are fantastical beings that are simply nicknamed after the real ones due to their closest approximal similarities? Are giant creatures considered to be gen genetically related to the normal ones? I understand that for their sprites, they are simply scaled up versions of the creature set, but I believe that this is in order to save time above all else. And that is possible that the canonical nature of the creature is not one-to-one. -one. But can you clarify? And Volleylol says, I'm also curious if there's an official answer to this. What they are in the current version of the game. Otherwise, it should be expanded upon when myth and magic drops for real. Are, are these giant animals monstrosities created by a force of chaos? only similar to normal animals as a mockery of their form? Are they a normal animals warped by the magic surging through the lands? Or are they escapees from the platonic realm of beasts, etc.? I imagine that will depend on their procedurally generated past in myth gen. And Tarn's response is, we don't have a theory for most things. We'd rather generate canon on a per world basis. Of course, we've had to make various decisions on for the default world but here we didn't make any decisions at all except for the fact that there are wild regions with giant animals which are tied in some nebulous way to animal agitation and elves and forces and titans and the big trees and sharp plants and we'll have a complete set of giant creature sprites with the adventure mode release and they're almost done and we've been conceptually vague with their art as well Though no longer pixelated, they are bigger with the occasional emphasized feature. Ideally, the magic release will give us all kinds of options, and they could have an in-game repercussions. Animal people are explicitly created in the prototype through whatever random incident, and giant creatures and every other kind of creature should also have some kind of explanation eventually with a procedural emphasis. And that brings us to the end of this month's Future of the Fortress. This was a pretty long one. Thank you very much for sticking around until the end. Uh, I should have a video with Putnam up in the next couple of days talking about the experimental patch. And uh, thank you very much, everybody, who have been watching these videos this whole time. I recorded this at uh, about 5.30 in the morning uh, because I couldn't sleep last night. So congratulations. You are getting early morning voice blind. Normally, I've had at least one round of talking and a cup of coffee before recording, but today was not the case. So thank you very much for watching this video. If my voice sounded a little weird, that's that's and uh, I hope you enjoyed the stuff I've been putting up recently. Thank you very much for following this channel, and I hope to see you in the next one.